unless you really want to hear about 3D printing and mm -hmm. uh, other uh, yeah. topics. For sure. <laughs> Everyone's already already fast forwarded. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone has moved immediately past this. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the people who are live are like, oh, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Am I the right level about killing chickens can, one more time? I <laughs> you can 3D print that, right? Another chicken to kill? You can, uh, yes, you 3D, 3D print, print chickens and then murder them. Murder the 3D <laughs> yes. prints of chickens. Yes. 3D print an egg. Uh, you can. Well, there's so many things that we can talk about today. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the pre-show banter. If you're joining us early, uh, we show up early because you show up early. You show up early because we show up early. It's a vicious cycle. And we're here 36 minutes early uh, for the webcast that Bo's got, mainly just because we're all nervous. Uh, there's thousands of people showing up today. And Ralph, uh, you didn't know this until just now, but you are actually doing the webcast. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> which I made which is amazing. Right because I actually hit up Bo yesterday about some Azure Cloud stuff. And so now that I have, you know, suddenly become the expert and I'm ready to present all of that information, this is super exciting. I'm glad, oh, yeah. I'm glad that yes. we made this happen. Yeah, no, I did, I, I made sure to include plenty of memes for you to go through. <laughs> it's going to go great. Yeah. Uh, so but you get to do the slides, but you get to watch Bo judging you the whole time. Mm. Oh. <laughs> mm. Ooh, I wouldn't have said that. Nope, that's actually totally inaccurate. <laughs> I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Speaking of not knowing what they're talking about, hey, everybody. Uh, if you are here and would like to join our Discord channel, uh, you can go ahead and do that. I'm going to drop the slides into GoToWebinar now. I forgot to do that, but I'm going to do it now. And so if you want to, you can grab the slides directly from Discord in the slides channel, or you can grab them here on GoToWebinar. Uh, and they're uploaded. Uh, you should be able to see inside the GoToWebinar interface. There should be a handout. I don't know. I don't get to see what you see. Yep, so it says handouts. Good. Okay, good. Uh, so go ahead and grab the handouts from there. And if you're like, what handouts? Feel free to ask questions at any time. And Dale will answer all of them today. <laughs> yeah, I heard Dale's an expert at this. <laughs> si okay, silence. Okay. All right, cool deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good job, everyone. Uh, yep. That, well, that was good. All right, pre-show yes. banter's wrapped up. You guys just get to listen in silence for the next. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it had to happen. Four minutes. <laughs> Thirty-four minutes. Had to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Be like the Jeopardy theme song. <laughs> the whole 34 uh, minutes. I just started crying because Alex Trebek was a you know near and dear friend of mine. Oh. Oh. <laughs> really? Well, because I watched him on TV. Like, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you you feel closer to him? <laughs> I feel very close to him. Bob Barker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Bob Barker was always there for me always when I was there. sick. And he cool. was always there. Come on down. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rogers, mm. let me leave. Just keep going. We, all, all the people that were there for you. Yeah, they were all there. No for longer. Me. Mr. Dressa, mm -hmm. yeah, friendly giant. So you, like uh, says, I've got two other web webinars going on right now. It's been months since I've missed a beach. This web be with you in spirit. <gasps> Thanks. <laughs> like that. I like that you did not choose us. I guess that's makes me a little. And sense. Sparks Flynn says, "Is this previously recorded or live?" Ooh. <laughs> mm. Stay well, tuned to find out today. <laughs> <laughs> we need like a newspaper or something to show <laughs> current date, you know? Like, like they do on Reddit, you know? Like they have like the newspaper and they put like the name, mm -hmm. username, and stuff to prove. Dude, yeah. I got it. I got it. Check it out. That little board back there, it's got the current uh, cryptocurrency prices. Oh, that point, way yeah. you'll know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's like time dating. <laughs> yeah, you're just looking you're like, what is this coin and why does it matter? And who cares how much it is? <laughs> well, at some point, it will be that price again. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah. Now, Ralph, are those real time uh, prices? Yeah, yeah, it's a real time. It's another one of those silly projects where you find a Raspberry Pi that you bought for something else and you finally put it to use. Yep, I got one too. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Intercept? Have you started selling those on Etsy then? Uh, no, actually, I found the uh, someone else had made like a quick how to build one mm -hmm. on possibly Etsy or some other like website about that instructable or something. And that's how I got the uh, idea and uh, was able to quickly make it. So uh, speaking of which, Ryan, are we live on YouTube yet? We are officially live on YouTube. Oh, how long we have, have about, we been live? 
We have about 40 <laughs> people watching, and it has been, well, it doesn't sh say here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Four minutes, five minutes, we've been live. All right. Wow. So if you put up with this for five minutes, thank you so much. If you fast forward to the 37 minute mark, you'll get to the very beginning of the actual webcast. So we'll go ahead and throw that little chapter point in there at some point so that you don't have to go through all this chicken killing Bitcoin nonsense that we have going on right now. Killing. It's, it's all I have in this life. <laughs> don't take it away from me. <laughs> so speaking of Bitcoin, what is the most secure Bitcoin cryptocurrency thing that exists? That's a that's a really open-ended question. Yeah, <laughs> right? Now, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, what is so, the most secure operating system? Yeah. I mean, so so I would say like let's let's bring that down to maybe like how to secure your cryptocurrency, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. like what would be the most secure way to store cryptocurrency? And for most users, it's, it tends to be like on the hardware wallet side, um, where you're actually taking custody of the coins that you purchase and not just leaving them on an exchange. Because that's one of the biggest things that happens to a lot of people when they buy cryptocurrency. Leave it on an exchange, exchange gets hacked, and there's like no way for anybody to reimburse that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Ralph, what do you think? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, most of the uh, stuff that we read or you know hear about as far as like insecurities and cryptocurrencies it's mostly just with uh, wallets and other private keys getting leaked out um you know ralph and i actually used to have a uh, podcast that we we did called coinsec podcast <laughs> uh, r.i.p uh, yeah r.i.p <laughs> with uh mike felch and uh uh steve borosh it was it was good it was a good podcast we should re resurrect it <laughs> yeah maybe we'll bring it back you know, the, the, it's it's all based on the price, though, right? Like the more the yeah, price only, goes only up. Yeah, only one is going up. That's the only reason to do it, right? <laughs> uh, the new wave of people going, you know, what is what is cryptocurrency? Hey, I heard that you know what Bitcoin is. You know, that's always that's when you know that's when you know it's going to crash. When I start hearing, uh, getting questions about cryptocurrency randomly from like people much much older than me. Yep, that's a good indicator. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So there was this uh, old adage that if you asked your server, like so you're at a restaurant and you ask them what they were going to school for, if they said real estate, then you bought stock. If they said stock or finance, you then bought real estate because the people who worked in the food service industry was always a trailing indicator of what was successful. So it would, by the time it, they got to the point where they could actually practice it, that would be passed and then you would do the, the opposite. I don't know if that's true. Did you do this? Um, but every once in a while, I would ask my server, like, so what are you, you know, like studying in school? And they're like, oh, you know, real estate. Like, all right, it's time to that. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone say anything besides real estate? Uh, I would hope so. It's a lot well, of agents. No, it was Florida, 2005, 2006 at the time. Yeah, yeah it's just mainly real estate. Mm -hmm. Either that or, you know, real estate. <laughs> Real estate. Yeah, they were talking about flipping <laughs> houses. You're like, oh, time to buy stock. Uh, also, if I ever talk to you about real estate or stock, just do the opposite because it's about, <laughs> it's on its way down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pro tip: don't take financial advice. So you're using the uh, the rest or the servers and restaurants as kind of the canary in the coal mine to time to get out. Yep, it's a uh, because they're. Because generally they would go into that type of industry because they see how successful it is, and, and so they start looking at getting school for that. Oh, timeshares! Uh, from being from Florida, if you've never been to a timeshare meeting, it is the greatest sales experience you will ever have in your entire life. Uh, you'll get to see an aggressive sales tactic. You'll get to see the best friend sales tactic. You'll get to see the you know the good cop bad cop sales tactic. You'll get the wait in the waiting room to get your free vouchers to go to a theme park. Like every single thing that can happen through the sales process. Like you're living Glen Gary Glen Ross at that moment. Like it is just. <laughs> uh, the person who took me on my tour to see uh, got fired uh, because he couldn't close me fast enough. Uh, so his supervisor came in and told him to clear out his stuff. And like the guys in the background, like putting his things into a box and walking past the glass. Wow. Like, I'm like, what just happened? Now you were still there? Wow, I was still there. It was like mid-spiel. 
Oh, and then the guy that fired him then came down and gave me like the super aggressive sales tactic of like, so you're going to be able to be a man and provide this for your wife or not. And I was like, <laughs> and so there was like a part of me, I was like, I'll wow. be a man and sign this paperwork. And, wow. <laughs> imagine so when imagine he didn't the same close, thing with that fired? What's that? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> No, so later on, the guy that was his boss came and said, "Hey, I need. I, I just want to apologize for him. He, uh, he's going through a really bad divorce right now. He's just having mm. all these you know, issues." Oh, so he's the good cop then. Yeah. He's so, the good cop. so just let me know what is the timeshare like? Is it nice? <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment where I started to contemplate actually like well, you know what that's actually it's actually a good that's deal actually a pretty good deal oh man so the number they start at yeah. i mean they like have it and then have it again and have it again uh, oh for sure yeah like, why don't you just start with that number like yeah. that, that, that if you yeah. keep going long enough they'll pay you to take it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i need my job man come on uh, you know, my, husband, my husband and i had a similar experience except we actually talked our timeshare guy out of being a timeshare guy he was like rethinking his entire like life and like what am i doing i did spend a lot of time like away from my family i don't even like my boss it's like you sold him on a better life, life. Hmm. yeah <laughs> maybe he quit he didn't get fired so he definitely quit. yeah and so, we did not get a timeshare so for all of you that own a timeshare currently <laughs> how was your experience feel free to put yeah. it in the discord <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell, tell us uh, what kind of timeshare you have and where it's at. <laughs> How much it costs. Yeah. yeah. You can just well, say, I got a good deal. Everyone got a good deal. Have you heard the ads of the companies that have sprung up on how to get you out of your timeshare? Uh, yeah. Like so oh. many people want to get out of your time. There's there's a market for it. There are companies that are like, hate your timeshare. We'll help you get out of it. Wow. Maybe that's not your experience. Your mileage. I was wondering there. what they do with it. Do they take it and then resell it to someone else? Like, do they have a double, kind of double kind of it. take it from you and then buy it from you or whatever they do? I don't know how they get you out of it. But. Yeah, I don't know. So, what do you no. invest in when people at McDonald's are talking about learning AI and machine learning, <laughs> blockchain? <laughs> they go pay them for it. Oh yeah, farming. Still the first, still the first. <laughs> What do you invest in when they use every buzzword known to man? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I have on. questions why they're working at McDonald's. I mean, they know a lot of buzzwords. I mean, that's half of sales right there. I mean, you know. <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> so if you've never been to a Black Hills information security webcast, we tend to speak our mind. And uh, all the time. And every once in a while, you know, people don't like that. So. Welcome. Thanks for joining. <laughs> I do like when we introduce ourselves and just not just assume that people know who we are. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason Blanchard. I'm the Content Community Director here at Black Hills Information Security. So if I've said anything that has caused you to not want to join our community, I apologize. Uh, and then sitting very far away from me. <laughs> so far. So far. Yes, Deb Wigley, Content Community Manager. Uh, I do apologize for Jason if he said anything to offend you. <laughs> Uh, please join our community. It's great. Uh, and if Deb keeps slamming the table with her hand, uh, that's what that noise is. So, uh, Ralph, who are you? Uh, Ralph May. I'm a tester at BHIS. I mostly just come here for the pre-show banter and to chit-chat with you guys. Um, so that's yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Um, that sums up support. my life. Yeah, yeah. I'm here for moral support, and I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, Dale, who are you? Uh, I'm Dale. I'm also a tester at Black Hills. I really come here to hang out with my American friends. Yeah, that's true, because uh, Dale is a foreigner. <laughs> mm. You say that like it's a bad word. He's, it, he's from another country. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, he's over the white wall, right, In, where it snows a lot over there. It's very snowy. Yeah, as soon as you're in an international lot. correspondent. It doesn't snow much where I live. Yeah. So one thing about Canada, and I, and I love our friends to the north, uh, but so when you live in America, the the temperature you know, the, on the news, they say, here's the temperatures in America, and they're pretty much gray out Canada, because that's not America, so they only show the temperatures in America, but every once in a while, they'll show this area that dips down, and so you see that it's cut off, but it dips down, and it says negative 50, and you're like, oh, Oh, 
Because what is above that? What is what is going on in that area that they don't show us? So Dale, I I don't know what what's negative fifty like. Cold. cold. <laughs> it doesn't get that cold. <laughs> more it, I mean, I'm on the west coast, so it's technically considered rainforest. So for it to hit zero or below is quite rare. But if you go to somewhere like Edmonton or wherever, then it's like cold cow. It's too chill. My like my friend lives in Edmonton, and he calls me all the time. He's like, oh, it's minus fifty today. I'm like, oh, it sucks for you. That's like twelve <laughs> degrees. I cut my grass. So. <laughs> I just so imagine say, it's always like Game of Th Thrones, right? Just uh, the whole the whole winter. Yeah, <laughs> winter's coming all the time there. <laughs> Impending soon. Yeah. Uh, I got a chance to play backwards and breaches with a team from the UK yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and normally in the scenario that I do, I say that the person goes on vacation. Uh, but I was like, oh, I have friends from the UK that I'm talking to. So Doug was on holiday. And I said <laughs> it with like a little holiday. holiday. And cool. I kept saying that he should have returned from holiday. And you could tell they were like, what is he doing? <laughs> just for us? Yeah. And, and then you told them what you were doing. I like, yeah. I'm just making it more you know, applicable. applicable to you. <laughs> like they weren't going to understand the word. Right. Yeah. I had, I had, Don't I had you see say, what oh. I'm doing? Yes. yes. I'm trying to uh, blend in. I want to be part of your culture. Yes. <laughs> uh, now that we've offended Canada and the UK. And the UK. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's keep going with interest. Maybe. So, who are you? Where Where do you live? I'm Bo. Uh, I'm from Florida. <laughs> it doesn't get minus 50 here. Um, I am a pen tester, red teamer at Black Hills, and also happen to be giving a uh, webcast today. Yeah, in so, 20 minutes. Yep. Uh -huh. That's me. <laughs> if you notice, uh, Bo starts pacing around a little bit more. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like. A little bit more pacing. Got to, got to move <laughs> and get the blood going. He starts doing the going down the stairs thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys have done that before. That's fantastic. Actually, I don't even have to do it with my like. I don't have to physically do it. I can just hit a button I and like the desk just goes yeah. down, and then I'm. <laughs> That's how I know both <laughs> ready for <laughs> <laughs> the elevator. That was so good. No, we're going That's how I know he's doing a webcast when he's uh, standing up. You get that stand desk. <laughs> mm. uh, Ryan, who are you? I'm Ryan, the shootist. I'm uh, in charge of the YouTubes and I edit things, video things. Yeah. Uh, to all of our friends over at YouTube, hey, thanks for joining us at the YouTubes. <laughs> right. yeah. YouTubes. Uh, if anyone needs the link to YouTube, let's go ahead and drop it in the chat here on Discord uh, so that you can just go straight there. If you'd like to, if you're like, go to webinars, just go 2020, uh, feel you're free to. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, go to webinars like the AOL of meetings now. <laughs> <laughs> the MySpace, yeah. Uh, it's AOL, MySpace, right. you had it right. Uh, what did you say, Ryan? I said MySpace had it right. Yeah. They're a oh, business yeah. model. You're friends with Tom? Yeah. Well, you're you know, friends with Tom. I, I want to be because he's like living the life right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess everyone raise your hand if you were friends with Forbidden also. Forbidden? No. Forbidden? No. What's part of that so, space? Oh, All right. So for Forbidden and Tila Tequila were like the first online influencers. Oh, yes. Um, oh, Tila Tequila. I don't remember Forbidden, but I remember Tila they, Tequila. I both, like, yeah. I think they both died tragically. Oh. Uh, and really, we're still alive. And, yeah. Interesting. I was not expecting the end of that story. Yeah. 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 I know Forbidden died tragically because there was one of those like, I wonder what happened to the first oh. online influencer. Oh. Mm. Oh. oh. Mm. That's not. Good. Now That's everyone funny. right now is googling that if they don't. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like everyone, like the Google's just hit like a spike <laughs> on the <laughs> search <laughs> results. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> uh, yell walkie thanks for being here sparks flynn thanks for being here noob noob, noob mode. mode grumpy vader cat always oh. thanks for being here tough as nails 15 thanks for being here yeah. uh, are, you, are you reading these names from youtube How, what is discord. YouTube? The discord. Discord. <clears throat> oh you're on discord okay never mind i see it then i'm on the discord <laughs> i'm on discord yeah. Yeah. three years from now we're like ah oh, remember discord <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool. That was cool back then. That was cool. Yeah. We okay. moved to new cool. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, hello, Andrea. I know. I mean, how many people are signed up for this? Like 30,000? I mean, eventually we are going to outgrow go to webinar. We're just not going to be able to do it anymore, you know? That's true. So we just hit 20,000 members on Discord, too. So 20,000 members on Discord. Thank you for being a Discord member. We appreciate it. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with others. Uh, for those of you that are community leaders, thanks for sharing. Uh, just helping us lead this thing. Because there is no way that Deb and I uh, could talk to all 20,000 members. Uh, we try. We try. That's what our days are. <laughs> what do we do all day? Well, we talk to 20,000 people. And, you know, happy. Yeah. That's a lot of conversations. I could just imagine your calendar. Just all those names on a list. So you yeah. Know so that's like, a great idea. We could put it on our calendar. <laughs> uh, so when, when a real person, like, sorry, uh, when a actual, let me put it this way, uh, when a person who knows me in real life texts me, I don't want to respond because it's like oh, I've just been responding to messages all day. <laughs> yeah, you can. Damn the opposite. I just ignore everyone else on the internet and then just respond yeah. to texts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's our job. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's a good and, point. Yeah. So we couldn't do that. And we're not doing it because we're paid to do it. We're doing it because we actually want to. Uh, but it does sound like we're paid to. Just be nice and friendly. Nice. Yeah, it's really the best job. Yeah, it is yeah. a really good job. Yeah. Uh, John, just now. <laughs> John did do it. And then, then there was like 70,000 people who knew John. And then he's like, I can't. <laughs> I need to hire someone to do this for me. Yeah. Fun fact, fun fact, John also used to put his personal cell on the website. <laughs> that didn't go so well, I don't think. He still gives it out during his classes, I think. Yeah, he does. He's got to give it out during his One classes. One of the students called him and he was like, hello. Yeah. During his <laughs> what? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is over. yeah. My computer's not booting. Do you think you give me a hand? <laughs> oh, Andrea's dog says hi. Oh, hey. It's horrible. Uh, so if you're joining us for pre-show banter, we have 15 minutes before the webcast begins. We are on Discord. I'm actually going to share my screen and share Discord for a few minutes in case you're like, what is Discord? Also, you don't need to join it. You can always ask your questions and go to webinar, and Dale will respond to all of them. So he is an Dale. expert. Yes. What's up, Smithereens? Thanks for joining us, friend. All right. So I'm showing Discord. We are in the live chat. Live chat room, uh, if you would like to know that there are going to be some channels that you can see uh, on my screen that you can't see on your Discord, and that's just because they're private, uh, so that we can all talk to each other uh, without talking to everybody. Uh, but the slides today are here in the slides channel. You can go ahead and download them, load them ahead of time so you can follow along. And what I really want to talk about today is, Bo, you have an album. Like, you made a musical album. Uh, I don't know if we call them that anymore. You made a series of digital bleeps and bloops files <laughs> yeah. bloop, bloop, bloop. that can turn into music. Uh, so tell us about, and, and this is pre show banter. The webcast begins in 14 minutes. But Bo made an album, mm. and it's good, and it's good music to hack to. Oh, thanks, dude. So, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, um, so I've been playing guitar for like, I think this year will be 20 years. And I, I don't know, for the longest time, like I've used to have, have plenty of bands and stuff and written a lot of music over the last 20 years. Um, and I don't know, like the, on the band side, like that, that used to be kind of the, the way that I wanted to approach music. You know, I really wanted to have just a band, you know, but I don't know, getting old and, you know, kids and stuff, it just hasn't really panned out much. Um, the closest thing I got, I think, was, you know, playing music with John at the last couple of Wild West Hackenfest where he mm -hmm. uh, you know, would sing over some of my songs. Um, but I don't know, just like the, the location I am doesn't have like enough musicians to just really get a solid metal band together. Um, so anyways, I, I decided to um, write an instrumental album um, that is 100% just me. And uh, basically, like, you know, like I said, I've, I've been playing guitar for 20 years. So I over those years, in addition to just writing um, music for a metal band, I've also had a couple of different projects. I actually had like a uh, quote unquote, like, um, uh, like, what is it? Like pseudonym, pseudonymous project, like, like where, you know, I didn't have my name that actually got pretty popular, um, 12 years ago, um, that was in an, an industrial metal band. Um, so I've, I've, I've had kind of a history with doing electronic music with metal. Um, and then in addition to that, I've also, I'm also a really big fan of instrumental guitar music. So things like Satriani, Steve Vai, um, Paul Gilbert. Uh, John Petrucci, uh, there's like some of my, my favorite guitarists. And I've always wanted to kind of put together an instrumental guitar album. So I was like, well, 
I like all these things, you know, I like instrumental guitar, I like metal, I like, you know, synth wave music. Why not just put it all together and uh, see what happens? So last year I spent the majority of the year just writing that, this, this uh, first album um, for a project that I call No Bandwidth. And uh, yeah, so that, that was released in December. Um, I'm already about 50% of the way done with the second album, um, which is pretty exciting. And uh, yeah. first single was actually due June 14th, which is pretty sweet. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically the story there. <laughs> yeah. And personally, whenever somebody shares their art that they've made, there's a little hesitation to yeah. like, you want to like it so that you can say you like it. And if you don't yeah. like it, you still want to like, Oh, that's great too. Uh, but <laughs> like, I genuinely like this music. I was like, wondering. As oh yeah, as I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, because there's like I really like, hate it. It's just terrible. It's, but it's, some, it's not for me. It's for somebody though. Right? Yeah. Somebody. There's got to be a person out there that would enjoy it. No, <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, three thousand people that I do not like it. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. So we do talk about it uh, from time to time. It's the intro music for the news. And so if you've ever like, oh, I really like the intro music from the news that you do, uh, that That's is cool. the intro music. So you can go check out, uh, I think if you're not logged into uh, Spotify, you can still click on the songs and you get to hear like the first 30 seconds of them. Uh, but if you log into your Spotify account, then you get the rest. Or you go to nobandwidth.io and grab them there. And then Bo, it's like you said, you mentioned the new album coming up. And then you do teach a class. Uh, you were the first, so John Strand teaches classes, right? So I think he's teaching one right now. If you're watching the recording, then he's not teaching it right now. Uh, but in real life, he's teaching it right now. Uh, it, but then Bo was like, hey, I have this idea for a cloud class. And so last year in the middle of pandemic, Bo, you wrote a class. And then it was the first time that we even experimented with even doing training, because we had John's training class, but he already kind of had that. Bo, you created like a brand new class from scratch. And then we did the four hour uh, free workshop where it was the first time we ever did that. And like 3000 people registered and we're like, oh, oh, we need help. Uh, Cause we didn't know how to do labs for 3000 people. We didn't know how to do oh, yeah. this for 3000. And so you helped us like learn how to do training. You helped us how to learn how to do training at scale. So definitely different talk, for sure. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about uh, the class that you've created? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it's actually funny because like this this uh, webcast has a lot of the content from it. So if you like the webcast, so you might actually like the training as well. Um, yeah. But basically, the idea was that um, you know we as pen testers have been going up against cloud environments like more and more. Um, it's been something that is has you know made its way into red team assessments, you know even like external pen tests. Um, <clears throat> and we like I felt like there's a need, like a necessity for. A, a methodology of sorts to go about testing these kind of things. And in, in reality, I ended up just creating a methodology of how I would go about approaching, um, assessing different cloud environments. So things like AWS, Azure, GCP, um, from start to finish. So the class that I wrote basically walks us through that entire process where we're starting with um, you know, recon, external attacks, um, getting access, you know, for the first day, second day is all, you know, post exploitation, privilege escalation, um, you know, being able to uh, harvest data, exfil data from different uh, uh, cloud services. Uh, third day is all about attacking infrastructure. So different pieces of cloud infrastructure, things like um, different, you know, virtual machines, um, databases, uh, functions, all the serverless stuff. Um, and, and, and then the fourth day, I actually take like kind of a, a reverse approach. So the first three days really are, are about us attacking an organization's cloud environment. The fourth day, we kind of pivot it back to um, us as red teamers utilizing uh, cloud services for performing red team engagements. So mm -hmm. on, on day four, we basically say, all right, now we are going to use cloud resources to go and hack stuff. Um, so we set up, you know, domain fronting, C2, um, we set up, um, uh, uh, we, you know, various uh, different phishing uh, mechanisms, um, interesting ways to to, to do uh, things like like OAuth consent flow attacks, um, that kind of stuff. So um, that's that's basically the gist of it. But it's a it's a four day class um, that is four hours each day. Um, one of the things that I think was kind of uh, important about us testing it out and and kind of learning the process was yeah. in regards to um, <clears throat> how we approach labs, because with with doing labs for 200 people remotely over the internet um you know it's it, it gets to a point where you don't necessarily just want to like stop and just sit there for 20 minutes and say hey 
here's 20 minutes of time, go do a lab. Because in those scenarios, it's like, well, all right, who's done, who's not done? You can't really like gauge, right? Like as, as an instructor, you can't really gauge like where people are at. So um, what I ended up doing is saying, okay, instead of just stopping and, and we're gonna just like take lab time, um, I actually do two hours of uh, office hours before and after class, where I just hang out um, and answer any questions while the students go through the labs. So um, during the class, you, it's essentially like, I mean, some people have kind of said it's like, it really, realistically, it's like an eight hour uh, a day class <laughs> because of that. Um, so generally we have, you know, the four hours of instruction where I'm walking through the actual slides and talking about the class and um, then going through the labs and demoing them. Um, but then two hours uh, before and after for uh, for for office hours. But yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you if you've taken a law of us hack and fast class, and you're like, oh, you guys have it down. Like you have instructions and you have downloads and you have hands on labs and you have all these things like uh, Bo is the pioneer for that. Like it was the all right, Bo, we got to figure out how to do this. And we did it with those class. <laughs> And, and it's yeah gone definitely really well. ran into you know speed bumps here and there but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's turned out pretty good so far yeah. I, like I like the format a lot I like that you called him a pioneer not a guinea pig that's nice <laughs> that's kind <of> yes <laughs> pioneer uh, he's so, in marketing <laughs> no I work in content community all right so we are in Discord right now if you want to join us you always can. Uh, the link is inside the good webinar chat or i think uh, ryan can drop it into or it's already dropped into the youtube if you're watching there uh, we're on youtube today and go to webinar because we're expecting thousands of people to attend this webcast and we want to make sure that if you go to webinar is not working for you you can go to youtube if go to webinar is working for you then you can use that uh, and so we want to make sure that we have a solution that works for all of you uh and so someone uh, don says dev and jason have the same weight yeah yeah <laughs> Dev and Jason do have the same we do. And background. Huh, when I do that. <laughs> yeah. They're so close. <laughs> Except her uh, camera lens is dirty. Uh, but I don't We're actually it. all in the same room. Um, we just all have uh, green screens. <laughs> yeah. Ready? <Totally>. No. <laughs> it's an office partition wall. That's what it is. Yeah. It's... Sure. It's, it's special. Uh, Thomas wants to know, am I late or early to the cloud pen testing? You are yes. early. It will start in four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, so if you would like to use the YouTube link, you can always do that. We'll drop it in here to go to webinar. Is that like something, like feeding something to something else that also it just feels weird to put a go to a link and go to webinar to YouTube? But that's fine. It's just me. It's my own thing. Uh, <laughs> Ralph is with us today to learn how to do uh, pen testing of Azure. Uh, we have Dale here to help us in answering questions in the back end. So if you have any questions here in good webinar, you can always ask. But we don't scale very well. Like it's just us. It's just us here. So uh, we've learned that if a thousand people are here and a few of those people can help answer any of the questions that you may have, uh, feel free to ask them in Discord in the live chat channel because the question that you may ask could be answered by someone else. And if not, we're gonna do a rapid fire series of questions at the end. So we're not gonna stop Bo at any time during the webcast because he does have a lot to cover. Uh, but at the end, we're gonna do an extended period of post-show banter where we're gonna uh, do rapid fire questions for about 10 to 15 minutes, unless we run out of questions and then we will stop and then we'll say goodbye. Anything else? Did I miss anything? Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks yeah. for showing up. Uh, oh, if you, 667 of you. Yeah, if you haven't gotten a t-shirt, uh, Black Hills t-shirt yet, uh, we're closing down the Spearfish General Store for the whole month of June because we have uh, Way West, Wild West Hackenfest happening in Reno. And so if you're going to that, Deb and I will be there. Bo, are you going? Yep. Yeah, I'll be there. I'm teaching can you, actually out there. Yeah, teaching. Can, can you perform your newest single? Because that oh, drops yeah. up on the 14th. Is that what you said? It's going to be a live performance. I'm super excited already. Oh, I'm so, oh man. That's... Sorry. Sorry, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> well, gonna Maybe not this online. conference, but actually no. So uh, one of my buddies actually um, has like kind of an in at Full Sail. Like Jason, you know Full Sail, yeah. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. have you heard of the Fortress? Yeah. Yeah. So I got something kind of in the works to do something video related there. So we'll That's see. That's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Ralph is like I said here to learn pen testing. Uh, we have and answer your questions and engage with you in Discord. Uh, Ryan is here to make sure none of this fails and crashes and goes down. 
Uh, Deb and I are here to respond to uh, any of the questions like, will the slides be available? Will the recording be available? Absolutely, the recording will, will be available as soon as this is over at YouTube, so at the link right there. Uh, look at Jason directly. <laughs> yes, thank you, Deb. Um, let's see, uh, we got two minutes, two minute warning. Uh, so for the 800 of you here early, if you wanna join us early, <laughs> Like next time we do a webcast, we do one of these about every week. Uh, in fact, next week we're doing a two hour workshop with hands on labs on Atomic Red Team with Kerry and Darren Roberts. And so if you would like to join us for that, it is limited to 1000 live attendees uh, because everyone gets their own hands on lab environment. And the way that they created this is fantastic. Uh, so everyone gets their own hands on lab environment to go and experiment with At Atomic Red Team. So it's very cool. And I think Deb's going to drop the link oh. to that here. And she's like, what? I just put hi there. So I did yeah. not. But okay. I hey, Bo, is, is, your, is your class at Wild Wild West Hat, or uh, is it just a um, in-person class, not online? Is, or is it yep. hybrid? Yeah. So the one I'm doing at Way West, I'm just doing in person. Uh, okay. But then the next one after that's July 13th. And that one will be fully remote. Cool. Yeah, I'll be there. Um, I'll probably just be handing out slides for you. So. So <laughs> All right, Bo, I gave the controls back over to you. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Uh, everyone that is not going to speak today, so Dale, Ralph, Deb, and Ryan, if you go ahead and kill your cameras. Hello, uh, fire. All right, everybody. <laughs> she scooted over. <laughs> there must be no Deb in the kit in the picture. Yeah, no Deb in the picture. All right, everybody, welcome to today's Black Hills Information Security webcast. If this is your first time ever joining us for a webcast, thanks for being here. If this is your second, third, fourth, fifth, a hundredth time for being here. Thanks for coming back, and we appreciate it. Uh, we enjoy sharing our knowledge with the community. Uh, that is what we do. We have a community of 20,000 members on Discord where we get together. And so, if you want to join that, the link will be here in Good Webinar or on YouTube, wherever you choose to watch. Uh, the community is going to help answer your questions, so if you ask a question inside Discord, uh, if it doesn't get answered, we'll see if Bo can answer it at the end. But we're not going to stop Bo while he presents today, unless something bad happens, like <laughs> to the equipment or anything else. Uh, so we have today with us Bo Bullock. He is a uh, pen tester here at Black Hills Information Security. And Bo, you've been around for a long time. You create tools like Domain Password Spray and Seven years, yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the first hires at Black Hills, and I've known you for years. I met you at Sands back when I worked there, and I watched you play Net Wars. Uh, it's, yeah, it was. You were one of the people I called when I said, "Should I come work at Black Hills?" Because I wanted I was to like, see. Yeah, you. yes, please do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, thank you so much for joining us today. If you ever need a pen test, Thread Hunt, or Red Team, or any of those things, you know where to find us. But that's not why we're here today. We're here for this webcast with Bo. So I'm going to turn it over to you. It's all yours, Bo. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. All right, everyone. Are we ready to uh, dive right into some Azure hacking? <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, <clears throat> so today's talk, getting started in pen testing the cloud Azure. So this talk is really meant to be a primer for Azure pen testing. Um, so I teach a four-day class where I, I basically walk through the entire methodology of attacking cloud environments, um, not just Azure, AWS and, and, and GCP as well. Um, but in that class, I cover a lot of Azure stuff. And um, I, what I wanted to do is, is basically treat this talk as a kind of primer to go over, here's all the things that I think, if you want to get started you know, attacking different cloud environments, specifically Azure, um, today, uh, you should be able to take this presentation and kind of go off and uh, you know, have, have a decent level of success uh, knowing, knowing at least the, uh, the various terms and what you're up against. So. Um, hopefully, you know, throughout today, this is going to help make you kind of uh, aware of some of the common terms associated with Azure assessments, as well as uh, some of the pot uh, potential attack surface. So uh, my name is Bo Bullock, and I am a uh, pen tester, red teamer at Black Hills Information Security. I, like I said, I, I wrote a course called Breaching the Cloud. Um, Got a few certs. Um, I, I primarily run red team engagements and uh, cloud assessments recently. So, uh, you know, historically, like, like I said just a few minutes ago, I've been here for seven years um, at Black Hills and kind of covered the gamut of, of different types of testing, you know, web apps, um, wireless, all, all the things, right? Um, but over the last couple of years, I've really focused heavily on just doing red teaming and uh, cloud assessments. So, throughout that experience, I've basically um, <clears throat> been able to you know, spend a lot of time focusing hard on the methodology of how to attack cloud environments. Um, I also written a number of tools, uh, 
there are a lot of them are out on GitHub, which we'll actually talk about a few of them today. And then I've also, uh, I'm also, I produce some synthwave metal music uh, for a project called No Bandwidth. All right, so roadmap, <clears throat> first things up. Um, what we're gonna look at right off the bat is looking at identifying attack surface. And the reason is because this is, to my, in my opinion, one of the most important areas uh, right up front of any sort of cloud-based assessment. We're gonna talk about a lot of the different angles you can approach Azure from because a lot of them are not are not uh, clear immediately. And some of them take a little bit of, you know, knowing that they actually exist um, and, and identifying those methods uh, before you even engage in a, in, in a cloud-based assessment. The second thing we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna go right into recon and external attacks. So we're gonna look at things like how can we identify uh, what what authentication mechanisms that um, that a cloud service uses? What kind of external attacks can we carry out? Um, are we able to hit public resources um, that are that are hosted in, in Azure? Then we're going to look at authentication. Um, so authentication is actually a, a fairly large section of this presentation due to uh, me basically thinking that this is one of the most important things. Um, so. When it comes to authentication, there's a lot of configuration uh, issues that can, can arise from not configuring things correctly um, when it comes to Azure. And a lot of the time, those kind of configurations um, are, they, they can tend to be pretty easy to misconfigure. Um, <clears throat> and then we're gonna go into post-compromise. Uh, so right after getting access to a credential, we'll look at what can we do with those credentials and we'll, we'll kind of explore a little bit of you know what what are some things that we could you know potentially attack what uh, what are some escalation paths what are uh, what are some 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 tools that we can use to to perform additional attacks following that um, and directly related to post compromise is going to come uh, the azure subscription hierarchy uh, because knowing what subscriptions are what resources are knowing how the the different roles and uh, uh, different permissioning is set up within azure is going to help us understand better um, what we can get to and then we're going to look at resource specific issues so in that section it's going to be kind of a rapid fire um, here's just a few slides of some things that i think are uh, some of the, the top most interesting things to just go after immediately and some things to be aware of and then <clears throat> we're going to look at um, leveraging scanning tools because a lot of the times uh and, and we'll discuss this uh once we get to the identifying attack service section we can we can make our lives easier by leveraging scanning tools to to find uh various you know low low hanging fruit in terms of vulnerabilities um and help help make our lives easier all right so why azure azure is one of the most ex like most popular uh pieces of software that i see um utilized by a lot of the organizations that we test so it's really really popular due to a few reasons right <clears throat> you've got organizations that you know historically have been you know at uh, microsoft a active directory shops right like internal microsoft active directory and now they're saying they're, they're thinking okay well um how can we make our employee force more productive remotely and pushing a lot of those resources to the cloud and since azure has that functionality of integrating internal on-prem AD with uh, cloud-based uh, Azure Active Directory, it makes it really easy for companies to move and um, have, that, have that access um, uh, and, and have that cap those capabilities to have employee workforce uh, utilize things like you know, Office 365, um, you know, things like SharePoint, that kind of stuff. So us as attackers, <clears throat> and, and honestly, like through a lot of the pen tests that we do, we tend to at least see some O365, some Azure usage um, throughout a lot of our engagements. And one of the things to note here is that you know hybrid environments are going to make uh, or, or can can potentially enable uh, these cloud to on-prem pivoting potential uh, potential paths as well. So you know us as attackers, if we're doing red teams, we're doing external assessments, or if we're doing even cloud-specific assessments, a lot of times what we're looking for now are how can we leverage credentials that we get during the engagement to um, attack Azure resources? Can we use that access to pivot? Um, and it, it really ties heavily into the process from like the red teaming angle uh, these days, because um, like I said, you know, we can go through an engagement where, you know, let's say we password spray a credential and now we have that credential within uh, Azure. What can we do within the context of Azure? Um, you know, instead of having that traditional, you know, firewall approach, right? Where, you know, old school, where you just have like the on-prem resources. Now you got to, you know, VPN in to get to anything useful. Um, a lot of the times what we're finding is that due to all these resources being publicly available, things like SharePoint, things like email, 
um, it makes it much more likely that we'll find things like sensitive data um, that's just readily available. So there's been plenty of assessments that I've been on where it's like we get a credential, log into SharePoint, and um, you know we find you know sensitive data out there, right? And in those cases, it's like, well, is it even worth pivoting internally if we have everything we need to to prove risk and show that there there's you know potential for sensitive data just out in SharePoint? Um, one thing to note throughout today is that a lot of the Azure pen testing techniques that I'm going to talk about will apply to different types of engagements. So I'm not going to be specifically talking about just Azure cloud assessments, but what you'll see is that learning about like what you could do within the Azure cloud context will directly apply to things like red teaming uh, engagements, external engagements, web apps, um, assume compromise, that kind of stuff. All right, so identifying a tax surface. So depending on the assessment type, your tax surface might change. Um, and like I mentioned on the previous slide, things like red team engagements, external engagements, cloud specific engagements, a lot of times what the assessment type is is gonna change what you're attacking and knowing what to look for in these different scenarios is gonna be really key. So throughout the section, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to clear up some of the, the common confusing points um, that I see a lot of people have issues with. So first up, identifying a tax service, right? <clears throat> All right, so in my opinion, there are realistically three different ways that we can approach looking at attacking Azure resources. We've got external, which in, in, in most cases, this is looking at Azure resources from a traditional external network pen testing context, right? Where we're looking com completely unauthenticated, attacking public resources, looking at, um, you know, what, uh, what uh, what what hosts are available? What virtual machines are, are available to to attack externally? What um, public buckets are out there? You know, storage, storage, that kind of stuff. Um, and one thing that I'll note throughout today's talk is that um, a lot of these things can overlap, and sometimes it's not super clear unless you you discuss with the customer what they actually want tested. Um, so I, I've had. I've had um, rules of engagement calls where it's like we've scoped a cloud assessment, but realistically they're looking for something like an internal network assessment. So that's where this second bullet point comes from. Um, so an internal resource access level pen test. So this would um, think of this kind of like a traditional pen test internal to cloud environments. So think of like a, you know having access to a virtual machine in a cloud environment where you're now assessing other cloud resources from that virtual machine. And a lot of a lot of times the reason you would want to do something like this is due to uh, you know cloud-based systems not being under the same you know asset management. They might have not they might not have the same inventory. They might not be under the same patch cycles. Because if you think about it, you know if you deploy software like let's say that you installed something like a SolarWinds Orion portal or something like that on a cloud-based virtual machine, a lot of times those specific pieces of software aren't might not be under the same um, update cycles, right? So we still need to kind of assess internal cloud resources as well. And then the third option, um, and this is one of the more uh, likely scenarios, is, is where we're actually provided API access, right? So we're actually authenticating to uh, the cloud service uh, where we have either a set of user credentials that have access to a subscription, um, and we can read uh, resources from the account. Um, or in some cases, we might even look at this as somewhat of an assumed compromise where we say, all right, who are your users of your Azure environment? Do you have developers? Do you have um, you know, other people that are, that are pushing different uh, services and resources out to Azure? And in those cases, we might say, okay, well, what would happen if this developer got compromised? What could they then do within the Azure context? Could they uh, you know, pivot? Could they escalate privileges um, and whatnot? So I tend to try to look at Azure at attacks from these three angles, right? So external unauthenticated attacks, internal resource to resource attacks, and then internal API access level attacks. The other thing that I see a lot of confusion from is the difference between Azure resources and Microsoft 365. So <clears throat> this, is, this is something where, you know, you hear the term Microsoft 365 and a lot of people uh, kind of use that interchangeably with the term Azure. And one of the things that I, th that I see that's really confusing is I see people that are like, okay, I got a user credential. And how do I now you know, see all the virtual machines or how do I see all the databases? Well, the problem is that <clears throat> even though you have a credential, that does not necessarily mean that that account has had a role uh, 
uh, assigned to it within a subscription context. And we'll talk about subscriptions um, later on today more in more depth. But in general, Azure Resource Manager really relies on subscription access to hit any of these resources. So um, if, we're, if we're looking at things like virtual machines, databases, storage, serverless technologies, um, th that kind of stuff, um, those items are resources that have to be a part of a subscription. And in order to access any of that stuff, you know, at any level, even reader level access, um, you have to have that role applied to your Azure Active Directory user account. So the confusing thing here is that Microsoft 365 accounts, anytime you 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 spin up a, a new Microsoft 365 account, new tenant, and you start you know provisioning uh, email and, and you know accounts for for users within your your environment, they get Azure Active Directory accounts. Um, <clears throat> so you can authenticate to Azure Active Directory. To, to, to Microsoft Online and read data from the Microsoft Online side, but not necessarily the Azure Resource Manager side unless you have a subscription. So um, that's that's something that I see pretty pretty often confused, right? A lot of a lot of times people are like, okay, well, why aren't any of these you know Azure modules that you know are part of PowerShell working? And it's likely because that that user is not a member of a subscription. All right, so recon and external attacks. <clears throat> in this section, I'm gonna run through some of the key items that I just look for right off the bat. So if you said, all right, Bo, you are on a red team against an, 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 an environment, or you are on a cloud pen test against this, this customer, one of the first things that I do is I, I try to identify Microsoft 365 usage. <clears throat> and one easy way you can do that is via this first URL here. So the first URL is this microsoftonline.com slash getuserrealm.srf. This URL, if you change that login uh, username at uh, the, the domain name of the company you're testing, .com, um, <clears throat> what you'll get back is a page that looks similar to this, uh, the screenshot here. So the screenshot shows a lot of information regarding that tenant, okay? So if that tenant exists, you will get information back whether or not they are uh, using Active Directory Federation services, um, if they're just using managed uh, environment within within Azure itself, um, where they're not using ADFS. Um, but if they are using ADFS, uh, here is a place that you'll actually get back the ADFS link that you would you would end up getting redirected to for authentication. So, in my opinion, this is this is a super useful just right off the right off the bat thing to do to identify. Microsoft 365 usage. The second link here um, is actually something that is really useful for identifying the tenant ID. So the second URL, um, if you if you add the target domain uh, within that within that URL um, to that Open ID configuration URL, um, you'll get back a a um, the Open ID uh, endpoints, and within those endpoints actually has the tenant ID, which the tenant ID can actually be useful later on if you got something like a like a service principal uh, credential uh, to authenticate. All right, so the other thing we got to look at is user enumeration, because we'll, we're going to talk about password attacks in a moment. But in general, one of the first things that we like to do is, is identify valid users. So we'll go through our recon process, build out a list of users uh, that we think are, are valid. So we, we, you know, we might you know, scrape LinkedIn or whatever service to build out a good employee list, then mangle that into some email addresses, and then now try to identify which ones of those are actually legit. <clears throat> because we want the most, um, I guess, like precise user list when we go into password spraying. So there's a couple of ways we can do this. Um, <clears throat> the first URL I have here is a link to a tool that I wrote called MSOL Spray, which we're also going to use for password spraying later on. Um, but this tool will tell you if users are invalid or not. Um, so hitting the the, the Microsoft uh, OAuth endpoint um, is actually really verbose. So this the screenshot we have here at the bottom um, gives you kind of an example of some of the information you might get back. So in this case, we'll see, you know, the user account does not exist in the directory. Um, so that's that's user enumeration, right? That tells us that, you know, that email that we tried to password spray with doesn't exist. One of the problems here is we are creating a failed login, right? So that's a potential, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for detection. Another way is the second, uh, <clears throat> the second um, URL I have here is a tool that does username enumeration via OneDrive. So OneDrive has custom URLs as well um, that utilize the email address, um, and you can use that to identify in, in some cases. So another thing that I like to look for right off the bat are um, <clears throat> data that's in public Azure blobs. So you know this is like <clears throat> one of the one of the things that you see. I would say the most 
news uh, uh, according to, or the, the most news articles associated with cloud environments is typically some, some sort of public bucket exposure, right? So think like Amazon S3 buckets that, you know, somebody put a bunch of data in, they just left it out on the internet, um, publicly available. Um, so this is something we can look for in Azure as well. So Azure has storage um, and they use this, this term called blob storage for, for Azure blobs. So think, think folders here, because <clears throat> when you create a storage account in Azure, it actually uses the name the, that the customer provides it. And in a lot of cases, that might just be something as easy as customer name, right? The company name. Um, and then the cool thing about Azure is that a lot of the services end up creating DNS, uh, DNS entries for, um, <clears throat> for a lot of the different resources, which you'll actually see throughout a couple of the slides today, um, some, other, some other services that do it as well. Uh, but the, uh, the, the storage accounts get in a DNS entry at storage account name dot blob dot core dot windows dot net if they create a storage account for, for blob storage. And at that URL, if, if they create containers, um, those containers are essentially folders and you can create permissions based off of, um, based off of the container level or the blob level, blob level, or you can just make it private altogether. So, <clears throat> If you create a blob um, where, or you create a, you create a blob storage where blob access policy, um, if you apply that blob access policy, um, that means basically that anyone who has a link directly to those blobs can access them. Um, there's anonymous access to those specific blobs. Um, so think kind of like, um, like if you go to share a file from like G Drive, um, and you have to have that direct link, right? Like it's not it's not directly something you would you would typically enumerate publicly um, or be able to list out by just knowing the container. However, if the container itself allows for read access, then the container can be identified via brute forcing, um, <clears throat> and then uh, then the contents within that container, including the blobs, can be uh, displayed as well. And one tool to quickly kind of go about doing this is a tool called Cloudinum from Chris Moberly. This is um, one of my favorite uh, tools for doing this across all three services because this hits Azure, AWS, and GCP, which um, is <clears throat> super useful. And the cool thing about Cloudinum is it doesn't just hit Azure, Azure, Azure resources. It hits, um, or I'm sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't just hit storage buckets. It hits things like, um, it looks for uh, databases, virtual machines, web apps. And this is using that, that method that I mentioned earlier uh, that we're just literally brute forcing DNS addresses, right? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, take what you get back from these tools as, you know, with a grain of salt, because, you know, anyone can go spin up resources with certain names if they are not taken already. So, you know, you can go, you know, if, the, you know, Google dot, you know, or Google storage blob wasn't taken, um, you could go, potentially take that storage blob and have it as, as your own within your own account if it wasn't taken. So, you know, if you're identifying buckets that are associated with a company's name, they're not necessarily 100% associated with them. So just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so after finding an open storage blob, one thing you could do is use uh, Azure Storage Explorer, which is another uh, tool that you could use to actually connect to that storage blob and start analyzing the data there. Um, you know, I've actually, I've had a couple assessments where I found public storage blobs and, you know, within the contents of the files that were stored out there were things like, um, credentials for other blobs, you know, like protected buckets. So, um, one thing, one thing that's kind of, I guess, like the uh, theme that we should kind of keep in mind too, is, you know, later on in engagement, right? If you get API access, if you actually are authenticating to, um, to the to the to the account that where the storage buckets are located, you can actually read the names of these different storage buckets, right? So you could determine um, based off of API level access which ones are public as well. And this is something if you're doing just a straight up cloud audit, something you should be doing, right? You should be identifying uh, via command line, right? Via via the API, what resources are being publicly exposed. Um, <clears throat> so one of the most common ways that we end up getting access though is through password spraying. And you know, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with the term password spraying, password spraying is essentially the opposite of most brute forcing or traditional brute forcing attacks. Where traditional brute forcing, we're taking um, a a list of passwords, like maybe you know, thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand passwords, trying those against one account. The problem with that is that's going to lock out accounts pretty quickly in most cases, right? Because a lot of a lot of account lockout policies are you know somewhere between like the five and ten attempt uh, <clears throat> threshold for locking out. 
So password spraying takes a different approach where instead of trying all those you know, passwords against one account, we're gonna try one password against all of the accounts. So we'll say, all right, here's the entire user list that I have available through recon that I, that I enumerated, that I know are valid. Um, and I'm gonna try the password you know, season year, something like winter 2021. This is something that we have really, really high success with. And the cool thing about um, the, the different ways to authenticate to Azure is we can do this uh, via command line. <laughs> so um, another tool that I, I put together is one called MSOL Spray, um, which I mentioned for the enumeration part earlier, but it can also do password spraying. That, that's the primary purpose of it. But the cool thing is, is that because of how verbose the endpoint is, um, we get back information about the account uh, in detail. So things like, is MFA enabled on the account? And the reason that's that's interesting is because uh, this particular mechanism of, of validating an, a credential won't actually trigger uh, things like push notifications. So it won't like automatically start the process for you know doing like the you know SMS message or, or phone call based MFA. But it will tell you that MFA is there. And then later on in this presentation, I'll show you how you can take that cred and go find where maybe MFA is not enabled. <clears throat> so the other thing, you know, if you if you're if you're spraying with it and you find that the tenant doesn't exist, then maybe you have the wrong domain. Um, <clears throat> if the user doesn't exist, we we've already talked about user user identification, right? Like we just take them out of the list. Um, if the account is locked, disabled, there's actually like like 200 or so different error codes um, that you can you can hit here um, or get back, and a lot of them come back, uh, you know, with various. Uh, uh, configuration around conditional access policies, which is that can be very, very useful um, for kind of figuring out where to go. One of the things that we end up coming up against, and I get a lot of questions about um, with regards to MSOL spray, is, is this thing called um, Azure Smart Lockout. So <clears throat> there's actually a couple different protection mechanisms within Azure for preventing password attacks. The first one is Azure Password Protection, and this is effectively like a password filter of sorts where you can. Um, say I don't want my my any of my employees to pick you know any seasons or the company name for their passwords. Um, so that will eliminate a lot of the common uh, password spraying candidates. Um, the other thing, Azure Smart Lockout, is something that <laughs> from the outside actually looks kind of terrifying because you start spraying these accounts and then now all of a sudden you're you're seeing where now everything's locked out. <laughs> and um, and it, but the, the problem is, or the the problem is with um, with how they display that information, because in fact you're not actually locking out any of those accounts. What's happening is Azure Smart Lockout is locking your IP address out. So it's effectively doing something similar to um, like a fail to ban of sorts, where it's just blocking your IP address. So how do we get around that? Um, we, we have to rotate IPs. And I, I see uh, Mike Felch is here. Um, so his tool Fireprox um, is great with MSOL spray. It works awesome. So Fireprox uses API Gateway to spin up an endpoint that you can point MSOL spray at. And each of the authentication attempts that's going through MSOL spray, or I'm sorry, that's going through, the, through Fireprox will be rotated through different IP addresses. So every single authentication attempt will come from a different IP address. And that, in most cases, will get around smart lockout. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about is authentication mechanisms. <clears throat> so this is really important to understand when it comes to anything cloud related. Um, this is this is going to cover different ways to configure things like um, like how how users authenticate to Azure and how on the back end that 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 authentication actually functions. Um, and then we're going to talk pretty deeply about conditional access policies here and potential ways to bypass them. So with Azure authentication, <clears throat> we've got more ways to authenticate than just username and password. Like we talked about spraying just now, right? But you, you know, there are actually other ways you can you can hit um, different uh, endpoints within Azure using things like certificates. Um, you can use, uh, you know, there's different APIs to hit. There's a few different multi-factor settings we need to consider um, that will differ for things like service counts and those that you know authenticate with certs. Um, <clears throat> one thing that you know I would say that we should be looking for as well are put the potential for public keys getting, or I'm sorry, private keys getting um, posted to public forums, things like um, GitHub repositories. So GitHub has a lot of things that kind of deal with that now um, to prevent that from happening, but we still see it every once in a while. Um, but <clears throat> realistically, finding and understanding these authentication points is going to be really key uh, to, to us, us understanding how we're going to go through the flow of attacking an environment. So 
on the cloud authentication side, there's a couple things to consider. This is this list is um, what I what I've collected together as what I think is like some of the more important things to consider when it comes to authentication. And we'll walk through each one of these. Uh, but the first three items here, so password hash sync, pass through authentication, ADFS. These are ways that we can configure how users are authenticating and how on the back end are being authentic authenticated to our own environment. Um, Certificate-based auth. We'll talk about conditional access policies, like I said. Um, <clears throat> Long-term access tokens for you know users that are authenticating via the APIs, um, and then legacy authentication portals. That's like the bane of most companies that we end up testing, um, where we end up getting in, tends to be legacy auth portals. All right, so let's talk about um, the ways in which we can configure Azure. <clears throat> so you have password hash synchronization. This is effectively a full clone of the, the user's credentials from your on-prem Active Directory environment into Azure Active Directory. So now anybody who's authenticating to Azure um, or services like O365, um, they're actually using their internal domain credential um, via email address directly against Azure Active Directory. And all of that authentication happens within Azure. Um, and one of the main differences between that and um, pass through authentication is instead of the credentials being validated in the cloud, they're actually being um, validated on-prem. So, so pass through authentication, credentials are just not stored in the cloud at this point. And what happens is you have a, a service that runs on a server on-prem that anytime somebody tries to authenticate to Azure or Microsoft 365, um, that service says, hey, what is that credential they just typed in? Let me validate it locally. Okay, that's correct. Let them into Azure. Um, so that's the main difference there. The third setup, and one of the more common setups that we end up seeing, is called Active Directory Federation Services. So the thing with, with ADFS is um, <clears throat> all the credentials, are, are they stay on-prem, first of all, and users uh, end up getting redirected from the, the Microsoft Online portal to your ADFS server, um, which tends to be an on-prem server as well, to perform that authentication. Now, the reason that this is important is because this setup tends to visually look different than uh, the, the previous two. The previous two setups, if you go to um, the Microsoft Online portal, you can authenticate directly there, um, and depending on which one, um, that credit will be validated. Uh, but with this setup, <clears throat> you cannot authenticate directly to the Microsoft Online portal. You will be redirected to an on-prem portal. So things like password spraying um, <clears throat> is going to be different, right? Because you're going to have to pivot your sprays accordingly, right? You're going to have to actually attack on-prem systems at this point, um, which in, in general, I typically just uh, intercept the request with Burp, like Burp Suite, and then just replay that request with different uh, users. So conditional access policies. <clears throat> So, all right. So, with, with conditional access policies, um, you know, during during any sort of offensive engagement that we do, we're commonly doing things like password attacks or phishing, where we're trying to get credentials, right? And there's a lot of times where we'll compromise a credential, and the MFA uh, that's in place can can sometimes stop that activity. Um, you know, there's definitely ways to fish and get sessions, right? Um, but in a lot of cases, we find where um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, uh, protections that get put in place to prevent us from using those credentials. So Microsoft 365 and Azure both have built-in MFA options by default. Um, generally, these are things like using the Authenticator app or OAuth, like an uh, OAuth hardware token or SMS voice call. Um, these are free features in most cases. <clears throat> so in addition to those, a brand new Microsoft account gets what's called security defaults enabled um, by default. <laughs> and this setting is actually really good. So if you spin up a brand new Microsoft 365 tenant and you create some users, um, <clears throat> they will get the security defaults policy applied to them. And why this is cool is because it, it does things like it requires users to register for MFA. It blocks legacy auth protocols. So things like Exchange Web Services, IMAP, like, the, the things that we end up as pen testers getting in with the most <laughs> um, to, will be blocked by default. So these are these are already off for new new customers, right? <clears throat> it requires MFA during authentication when necessary. So like if I'm authenticating from a new location, um, instead of it just allowing me in, I have to use MFA again. Um, and then protect and it protects privileges 
um, or protects privileged activities like getting access to the Azure portal. So it will block that by default. These are really awesome settings, right? Like these are things that you want enabled. However, um, <clears throat> a lot of companies tend to need more granular settings. Um, so let's say that a company needs, uh, like let's say they have like a C, uh, you know, C suite of people, you know, um, CEOs, CFOs, CTOs that don't like MFA. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's sad, but it's reality, right? Like we have, you know, a lot of a lot of companies that that just, you know, they, they want to make it easier on certain certain employees. So they disable MFA for them. And to do that, to to create specific policies where you are providing that level of access to to employees, um, you actually have to disable security defaults. Um, <clears throat> so the problem here is that when you when you start disabling security defaults, now it's on whoever is configuring conditional access policies to start re-implementing these other things that were already protecting the account. Um, and that that's where a lot, like in my opinion, that's where I see a lot of uh, the the configuration issues come come to come to light. Um, it's it's when you know they take the defaults that are actually pretty decent already, disable them, and then have to rebuild them, them themselves. So, <clears throat> what are conditional access policies? Well, they're they're fine grained controls for creating different levels of access for when a user can get in, you know, with or without MFA. Things like the the username, the location they're coming from, the devices, the actual device they're using, the application they're authenticating with, um, and there's also this thing called real time risk, which can you know kind of a, kind of provide an additional level of when are we going to you know validate MFA. So like to, to give you another example, I've tested organizations where they've used conditional access policies to do things like allow <clears throat> single factor access to Microsoft 365 from their own IP space, so like their own on prem network. But required MFA everywhere else, um, and you know these are the types of scenarios that we end up seeing. Things like that. Now, <clears throat> like I said, the bane of like most of the companies we end up testing tends to be legacy authentication portals, and the reason is because a lot of these legacy auth portals don't actually support MFA directly. So things like Exchange Web Services. This is a service where you can authenticate and read or send email, and it's something like I wrote a tool called Mail Sniper to you know read email from from Exchange Web Services. And whenever you enable MFA on an account, you either have to go disable uh, Exchange with Services altogether for the user, or you have to um, have them create an app specific password for the, the things they need. So historically, what we've seen are, uh, or, or let me let me rephrase that. Historically, why we have seen it enabled tends to be due to specific applications that employees need. So things like um, Outlook for Mac, it used to only support Exchange Web Services, and so you know, they would create a rule that just says, all right, everyone who um, uses uses Mac can hit Exchange Web Services. Um, and, you know, sometimes these these can completely block, or I'm sorry, um, these these different legacy portals can be completely blocked with, with conditional access policies. The thing that I think is kind of funny here is that if you look at the, the checkboxes on the right, <clears throat> for under, under legacy auth uh, clients, we've got um, Exchange Active Sync clients, and then you have other clients. So you have, um, the ability to to just allow Active Sync for some reason, um, and then all of the other legacy auth gets grouped together. I I don't understand completely why they left Active Sync out of this single bullet point. Um, but what I've ended up seeing, what I've, what I've ended up finding out is that a lot of people don't click that Exchange Active Sync clients and allow that, but they block everything else. Um, <laughs> so we'll talk about again um, in a few slides here. I'll show you how you you figure out which uh, which portals are accessible. Um, so one thing that is kind of interesting is that legacy auth was supposed to be end of life last year, uh, but due to COVID, it actually got pushed back to the second half of 2021. Another thing in, in, that you can you can um, you can configure with conditional access policies are device platforms. So device platforms are basically the operating system in which the user is authenticating. And the thing that's crazy about device platforms is it literally is just using the user agent string. So <laughs> to to validate a user coming from an Android device, it literally is just saying, oh, you used an Android user agent. So <clears throat> what that looks like is this, where you've got on the left authentication without a mobile user agent. So I'm basically logging into my account just with a web browser and I get my MFA prompt. Same exact account on the right, logging in, but I manipulated the user agent to be an Android mobile user agent and MFA was not applied. I've seen this on assessments where companies say, all right, if they're coming from a mobile device, no MFA. Um, so 
you know, things like that are things that we want to be looking for. And <clears throat> to help with finding this kind of stuff, um, I wrote another tool called MFA Sweep. So this tool, is, the whole point of it is to help us find these inconsistencies, right? Where, you know, the organization's trying to do a really good job by deploying MFA, but due to different con conditional access policy configurations, they may have left one of these single factor. And um, basically what the tool does is it says, all right, give me, give me a set of credentials and I'm gonna just try it against all these different endpoints. So um, I've collected together a list here of what I think are some of the, the top endpoints to at least attempt to authenticate to. Um, <clears throat> so we've got the Graph API, we've got the Azure Service Management API. Um, we talked about Exchange Web Services. Um, that's another super common one that we see exposed single factor. The actual web portal, we, we, we try to authenticate to. Um, the web portal using a mobile agent, we try to authenticate to. Um, we try to hit Active Sync. And like I said, because that is a separate checkbox, um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll find that everything else is two factor, but Active Sync is allowed. And then finally, um, it also has the ability to hit ADFS. So to run this, if you, if you want to try this, um, just be careful because you know it is, it is trying to authenticate to that, that specific account um, six times, seven if you use ADFS. Uh, but basically, it's a PowerShell script that you just import into a PowerShell session, and then you would run invoke-mfa sweep and give it a username and a password. And it will try to go authenticate single factor each one of those and let you know uh, which ones are single factor. You can also, like I said, check ADFS. And what it does is we'll try to check that, that initial URL that I, I showed you on uh, the recon slides, uh, where it will point us to that ADFS endpoint and attempt to authenticate to that ADFS endpoint uh, using single factor. And if it does end up getting redirected to, to the uh, multi-factor uh, pages, it will tell you that it's an indication of MFA being in place for that user. All right, post-compromise. <clears throat> After we get credentials, what are we going to do next? This, so this section is really going to have um, some go-to actions uh, for, for basically following successful compromise of credentials. And um, this is, you know, like I said, I teach four-day class on this. So this is by no means like, um, you know, everything that you would do. But I'm going to try to just give you some of the, the high-level high approach to um, how I would go through uh, post-compromise here. So first off. <clears throat> Who do we have access as, right? Like we just got a credential. We need to figure out who that user is. Um, is that user just an Azure Active Directory user or do they also have roles applied within a subscription? These are things that we typically might wanna figure out. Um, is MFA enabled? What can we access? If, if we do have access to a subscription, can we get to access to, or can we read data from things like web applications, storage? Um, who, are the ad, who are the administrators? Who, um, how are we gonna escalate privileges? Um, and then additionally, if you have access to the Microsoft Online portal, um, <clears throat> via, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the various Microsoft Graph API endpoints, um, you can actually enumerate some security protections, uh, like things like um, ATP licenses. Um, so after getting a cred, <laughs> one of the first things I typically like to do is just see if we can get to the Azure portal directly. Now, <clears throat> one thing that's kind of cool is that the Azure portal actually relies on the same Microsoft Online authentication. So if you fish a credential with something like Evil Gen X 2, and you have a session to, let's say, just Office 365, right? Like you're, you're in their Outlook. Um, let's say that you're in, you're in their Outlook account, right? Like the email. That same session can be utilized to attempt to authenticate to uh, the Azure portal. And if they have not disabled access directly to the Azure portal, you may be able to just go to portal.azure.com and you, you can be presented with the actual Azure portal itself. And <clears throat> why is that useful? Well, you know, like I mentioned earlier on, when we started doing recon, we built out an employee list, right, for password spraying. And we use that list to uh, attempt to compromise accounts. Well, let's say that we did compromise an account. Now, let's go get the full user list, which you can get from um, either the global address list or if you have access to the Azure portal, you can get it from um, the Azure Active Directory users page as well. <clears throat> and <clears throat> here's the thing, even if the portal's locked down, a lot of times the PowerShell commandlets, the, the AZ CLI tools will still work um, because locking that down is actually a little bit more difficult. It's not just a checkbox. Um, there's, there's a command that you have to run um, as, a, as a global admin to disable access to the command line for all users. Um, so 
I I've actually like I've had customers where they blocked um, access to the Azure portal uh, via di different conditional access policies. Um, maybe maybe it's MFA, um, <clears throat> but I was able to hit that same um, API via command line um, single vector. So things to consider. So when it comes to command line access, this is in most cases going to be where we want to operate, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a so when it comes to the different PowerShell modules that are available to us, um, I want to explain kind of the, the, some of the key differences here. So we have <clears throat> the AZ PowerShell module. The AZ PowerShell module is uh, realistically how we're going to enumerate and identify things from subscriptions. So things like resources within subscriptions, virtual machines, databases, storage accounts, that kind of stuff. Um, the Azure AD and MS Online modules are heavily focused on just the, um, the, the Azure AD side of the house. So those modules will allow us to do things like enumerate, you know, groups, user accounts, service principles, um, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> there's also Azure CLI tools, um, which is another cross-platform tool if you don't like PowerShell um, that will that will work as well. Um, and <laughs> so, you know, we only have 15 minutes left of class, so I don't have a whole lot of time to just throw a bunch of commands at you. But what I did is I put together this list of cloud pen test cheat sheets. And it's not just Azure specific. So I've got AWS, GCP, and Azure in there. Uh, but in those Cloud Pentest cheat sheets, um, there's plenty of commands to get you started uh, with all three of these uh, different, different tools. All right, let's talk about the Azure subscription hierarchy. So you know, after we've been able to get into an account, we now have CLI access, potentially, or even portal access. Um, let's say that we did get access to a subscription. What does that even mean? <clears throat> so Organizations, at the top level, you have the tenant, okay? Um, the, the tenant contains the, the ability to create different, le different licenses for different services, different products. Um, but when we talk about subscriptions, subscriptions are uh, effectively where we're going to create different resources like virtual machines, databases, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that I think is, is often confusing is, you know, software licenses like Microsoft 365, they can be purchased and those licenses can be applied to users, but that is not a subscription, okay? That's one of the things that, again, like I, I think that that can be a little bit confusing for some people because, you know, <clears throat> just because it's all in Azure doesn't necessarily mean that it is, um, you know, Azure subscriptions. So um, I wanna make that clear because, you know, when we talk about subscriptions, we're not specifically talking about Microsoft 365 licenses. Um, so Azure AD has multiple tiers that can be purchased. Um, and, and under those tiers, um, and, and, and well, I guess in general, like subscriptions tend to be, um, you know, grouped for billing purposes. Like there's no, um, like, like the reasoning behind why, why a user might create multiple subscriptions is completely dependent on them. Right. Well, I mean, technically you could have. Um, you know, a tenant that has, you know, 100 subscriptions or even 1,000 sub subscriptions. Um, it all depends on what their use cases are. But in general, they might divide it up billing purpose-wise, right? Like they might want to know how much um, their development shop is spending versus the production environment um, versus the lab, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, and, and one of the other key things to understand with subscriptions is just because you authenticate and you see that you have access to a subscription doesn't mean you have access to all of the subscriptions. So sometimes you might find that authenticating, you see a subscription there, but the resources within that subscription are the only things that you have access to. However, unless you've been provided roles within each of the other subscriptions within that account, um, you wouldn't see them. So <clears throat> under subscriptions, we have resources and resource groups. So in my opinion, one of the, the best first things that we need to do is identify um, what what it is what what is the purpose of the subscription that we're operating in and a lot of times you'll see naming conventions that can help us identify what the purpose is right like you might see the name prod or dev that can kind of help you at least understand a little bit about the subscription um, <clears throat> but each subscription can have resource groups under it things like um, you know we might we might group web application with a, a database that you know, they have some sort of interaction, right, within a resource group. But at the end of the day, those are realistically just folders that um, can help us organize things. Um, but the resources are realistically where we want to look. Um, and 
why why the different levels are important is because each resource, each resource group, each subscription can have policies and permissions applied to each level. And the the roles that they get applied to subscriptions at different levels are hierarchical. Um, so they, they actually get inherited down. So if you apply, um, let's say owner level access to the subscription, that means everyone un or every single resource, every single resource group under it, that user is an owner of. Um, so there are some default roles within Azure to know about. First off, um, subscriptions uh, can have, well, in, in general, any resource, in, including subscriptions, can have um, owner level access, which is generally like the full control access. Um, contributors um, have all the same rights, except they can't um, change permissions. Reader level access can only read attributes. And you know, if we're doing like a cloud-based pen test, generally what I ask for is just reader level access, <clears throat> um, where we're, we're authenticating to the account and able to read all the resources. And then another common one is uh, user access administrator. <clears throat> okay, so you know we've gone, we've kind of gone over, you know, a little bit of post compromise, a little bit of, um, you know, what what to do, what 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 are the things to know about, and <laughs> these next few slides are really just rapid fire, high level things that I wanted to cover um, as things to look for um, immediately. So each of these topics can be dug into much deeper. But having a general awareness of them, I think will be a good place to start. <clears throat> All right, so first up, serverless environment variables. So this is something that I have had great luck in finding clear text credentials just applied to things like Azure Functions. So serverless uh, technology in general. So if you looked at AWS, they have Lambda Functions, Azure has Azure Functions. The whole idea of these are to create some sort of action that gets triggered based off of some other thing. Um, and you know, with Azure, you can set up things like, um, hey, if a user uploads a file to this OneDrive share, um, trigger this you know flow to go run this thing on that file. Um, that could be that could be a a function. But what we end up seeing a lot of times is where um, organizations include secrets in those Azure functions directly. And if you have reader level permission um, to those to those functions, you can actually call out. Um, and see those plain text values as well. Um, what they should be doing is pulling those secrets from key vaults, um, which is, uh, you know, so it's, 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 that'd be a potential recommendation there. Um, <clears throat> but I've had I've had multiple assessments now where I'm I'm doing cloud-based uh, pen tests where you know we were provided a reader level credential um, to an account. We read the um, read you know the the different functions and see credentials within those functions and then are able to use those to escalate and get additional access all right another thing um like i said this is gonna be kind of a rapid fire just high level high level overview of a few things um another thing is instance metadata service so this is something that across the cloud services i think that a lot of people might not understand is actually something that exists and it honestly when i first learned about it i was like Wow, really? <laughs> so, all right, whenever you spin up a virtual machine within a cloud environment, whether it be AWS, GCP, um, Azure, a, an actual web uh, application gets spun up on an endpoint um, at the non-routable IP address of 169.254.169.254. And the whole point of this is to be <clears throat> a way for that, that server to help orient itself um, because of how dynamic cloud services are. And so this metadata endpoint can have all kinds of stuff. Like it could have, you know, data about the account, data about the subscription, data about resources, that kind of thing. Um, but you can also apply managed identities to uh, two different resources. So things like a virtual machine may have a managed identity applied to it where it can assume uh, a set of credentials for accessing other resources. And in the case of having access to that metadata endpoint, you can actually call uh, the the endpoint and get get a, a set of temporary credentials and so this is something that like if you look at like um, some of the the bigger AWS um, <clears throat> compromises they've hit the metadata service via web attacks things like um, server side request forgery because the whole point of this is that it's it's you know it's supposed to not be accessible externally right it's supposed to only be reachable by the local host however um, through through vulnerabilities like server side request forgery, we can cause an application to send a request on behalf of the server itself to its local host, i.e. the metadata service. And so sometimes via web application vulnerabilities, you might be able to actually 
um, <clears throat> hit the metadata service and get more credentials. Another thing, um, so we talked about having access via uh, the MS Online PowerShell module to Azure AD. So anytime you have a user credential that you know has access to something like Microsoft 365, um, <clears throat> those user credentials can typically read data from Azure Active Directory, and you could use the um, MS Online module to do that. One of the things that we look for on pretty much every pen test are when <clears throat> credentials end up getting stored in actual Active Directory user attributes. And what I mean by that is uh, occasionally you'll find where like maybe a help desk um, uh, engineer has, has created a new user. And for some reason, they put the user's password as an attribute, whether it be like in the description field or, or, or wherever. And so this is something that like historically we've done a lot of, and we found a lot of credentials internally on, you know, traditional on-prem environments. Um, but if you want to look for the same thing in the cloud, um, you can use the MS online module. And then um, I wrote a quick one-liner here um, to go look for the term password. And you can change that too. Cause like sometimes it might be cred or it might be, um, I don't know, like uh, login, that kind of thing. All right, <clears throat> service principle hijacking. This is <laughs> this is a topic that um, I literally have like, I don't know, 10 slides on um, in my class. So I'll try to describe this as quickly as I can. Um, here's the thing with, with this particular issue that I think is, is fascinating. Anytime you create a Microsoft 365 account, by default, that account will spin up 200 service principles within your tenant, okay? And none of them are actually listed in like the Azure GUI portal under the users uh, section. You have to go to like the service principles to actually see them. Um, but the, the thing is they all have varying levels of permissions on Microsoft Graph. Now, this can present a, an interesting privilege escalation opportunity because let's say that you compromise an account for some, somebody that is an application administrator. The application administrator role allows users or allows, allows the application administrator to change passwords or certificates for service principles. So even these default ones that get spun up. Um, <clears throat> so one thing you could potentially do is identify an account that has a higher level privilege than your application administrator. Now, one thing that you know application administrators typically, typically can't do are things like create new users or modify the directory. Um, they can only do things against applications, so things like service principles. Now, if you change the password or add a new password or add a certificate for a service principle that has that permission, you have now escalated privileges, right? So that's potential privilege escalation opportunity. Key vaults are another um, thing that is pretty interesting to look at when it comes to, to Azure-based pen testing. So Key Vault is, is what it sounds like, right? It's a vault for storing your passwords and other secrets. Um, <clears throat> you know, other cloud apps and services can typically use these, uh, you know, i.e. like Azure Functions should be. <laughs> um, and it's easy to store things like SSL, TLS certs. Uh, many times like the data you want access to might require additional credentials. And to get them, you might, it might be as easy as just like getting access to the Key Vault. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting about Key Vaults is that by default, only the owner of a key vault can actually access those keys. Um, however, contributors have the ability to actually modify certain permissions on key vaults. So as a contributor to a key vault, like let's say that you got access to a contributor uh, account for a key vault and attempted to, to, to read keys from that, that vault, you'll get access denied. But the thing that's crazy is that contributors can actually modify their own permissions to give them the read permissions they need to actually read data from those key vaults. So something to, to, to definitely keep an eye out for. Um, <clears throat> last thing on these, these key things to look at is getting data, right? Like one of the key things that we wanna do as, um, as pen testers at Red Teamers is what data can we get to? And one of the like, in, more interesting approaches to this is just doing what's called a compliance search in Microsoft 365. So if you get global admin, um, or, or even if you compromise a uh, member of the e-discovery manager role, you can actually search and report across all of the Microsoft 365 services. So you can actually report across things like, you can search for things like passwords, secrets, all that stuff in the entire organization's email, all the Skype messages, all the Teams messages, all the SharePoint sites, all the OneDrive accounts, um, <clears throat> and find where the sensitive data actually is. So, you know, historically we've, you know, on-prem, I wrote MailSniper to search through email for that specific purpose, but now this is like that on steroids, right? Um, so we did this in an org where 
um, compromise after compromising global admin, this helped us identify potentially sensitive data that was in, you know, email and chat and stuff. All right, to, to wrap things up here, I'm going to talk about scanning tools real quick, because this is something that is very, very important to, to how we're going to approach um, assessing a cloud infrastructure from an automated perspective. Um, you know, like I said, there's multiple angles that we got to kind of look at, you know, looking at Azure from. Um, first one being <clears throat> external, second one being internal, you know, access via um, via like a virtual machine to other resources within that account. And then the third thing would be API level access. So having the ability to run scans can help us quickly identify certain vulnerabilities, things like low hanging fruit. Um, but you know, this might not be something you run on like a red team because this can be a bit noisy, right? Um, and generally all we need is an account to read permissions from, uh, from the different resources. So one of my favorite tools for this is Scout Suite by NCC Group. Um, <clears throat> so the cool thing about Scout Suite is it's multi-cloud. It supports you know AWS, Azure, Google, GCP. Um, but this is one of the one of the first things that I typically end up running on an assessment because I would like to get data back quickly about the account so I understand like what's there. And you know in some cases you know we might be like you know testing you know hundred thousand resources and um, and in order to do a good job of kind of getting through that data quickly, um, we need to automate some of that. And so Scout Suite's a good tool for that. Um, another uh, like slide here with a few different tools to look at. Um, so if we want to like look at doing a, a full on um, download of the entire Azure Active Directory um, data, Road Tools is like the way to go. Road Tools is, is an amazing tool. It's one of my favorites um, after getting access to a user credential. So Road Tools and Road Recon will go and actually copy off um, all the users, all the you know MFA information, um, uh, service principal information, that kind of stuff. Um, groups, so you can actually like look through that data um, offline as opposed to just running a bunch of queries um, directly while you're testing. Then PowerZure and Microburst are two amazing PowerShell tools uh, for for doing all kinds of this stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, for you know doing post post compromise, recon, um, dumping key vaults, that kind of stuff. Um, amazing tools if you want to help if you want help with automating some of that approach. Um, StormSpotter and Azure Hound, great post compromise tools for uh, doing things like finding paths of escalation. So if you're familiar with Bloodhound, Azure Hound is the Azure equivalent of that, um, where we're now using uh, the ability to, to identify resource permissions and potential privilege escalation opportunities there. All right, so key takeaways for today. <clears throat> Recon is absolutely the key for us, right? To understanding cloud asset usage. You know, being able to identify publicly available resources, anything like that um, is gonna help drive how we're gonna attack that company. Cloud attack service is gonna enable us, in, you know, multiple ways to gain access. So we talked about, um, you, know, uh, you know, API level access, looking at different ways to get around conditional access policies, um, that kind of thing. Configuration of cloud resources is still a wild west. It really is, and it's changing daily. Like a lot of the, you know, conditional access policies that you put in place today might not be, you know, efficient tomorrow um, because there's new services that get spun up, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> key methods for gaining a foothold are going to include, uh, you know, things like, like I, like I mentioned, you know, key disclosure, public public re repositories that have keys in them, um, pa performing password attacks, phishing for access, um, and then, you know, ultimately potential uh, remote code execution. You know, if we can get some sort of um, web app vulnerability or even command injection, that kind of thing. We might be able to read data from um, that that uh, metadata service. And then uh, situational awareness after we get access is going to help drive our decisions post compromise. So, like I said, you know, today's today's talk was um, <laughs> a lot of just hey, here's how you can you can use some of this information to get started. Um, but I do teach a four day class on this, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I will be. I'll be hanging out for a little bit um, to answer any questions because I know we didn't we didn't stop at all in there <laughs> for questions. So if you guys got questions, feel free to throw them at me. Oh, they got questions, Bo. They awesome. got questions. First of all, hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. If you ever need a pen test, a thread hunt, a red team, you know where to find us. Uh, but we're going to go into overtime right now. So we're, this is what we call post show banter. So if you need to leave, totally understand. But we're going to stick around and answer it rapid fire questions as best we can. And so. We're going to give Bo about 10 to 15 minutes, unless we run out of questions. Yeah, that's possible too. Uh, but first question, Bo, let me go ahead and take a look. Uh, it's only like 72 or no. There's not <laughs> oh, God. Uh, there's not that many. 
Uh, are Microsoft Azure admins prevented from seeing blobs or data without a policy? And with a policy, are Microsoft admins still able to access a particular data store across any cluster? I think that's two questions. But... So they would they would need um, <clears throat> certain permissions to those to those blobs, right? Like they would need either viewer or reader level permissions um, in most cases. But if they're an admin, if it's like a global admin, then they can give themselves access. So Fun, fun fact, <clears throat> there's actually um, a checkbox in, in Azure. If you're a global admin, you can actually give yourself user access administrator across all of the subscriptions within that tenant. And it literally is a checkbox. So if you have global admin access, you just go click that checkbox <laughs> and now you're user access administrator to everything. <clears throat> and, um, and so like, yeah, potentially like, and if you're an admin, yes, you, you have access to all of the subscriptions. Okay. And previous engagements, have you encountered smart lockout and how has that limited your access attempts? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I, I, I talked about that a little bit on, on the password spring section, definitely have come up against it. Uh, but these days I pretty much just, you know, combine uh, Mike's tool, uh, Fireprox with MSO all spray to rotate IP addresses to get around that. Okay. Yeah. Whenever I play back to some breaches with people, I, I always tell them about Fireprox. And the reason why I want them to know that it exists is because all of your way of doing defensive is not gonna work anymore now that Fireprox, like, <laughs> it seem like, well, that does change things, doesn't it? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Look, look at these tools here. <laughs> uh, is there a port, speaking of Fireprox, is there a port scanning equivalent for Fireprox? Um, so, I, th I like, that's definitely a question for Mike, uh, but I think that, um, you know, it's, it's mainly URL based. And so you point it at a specific URL. So um, if you wanted to do something like a port scan where you're rotating IPs, I think proxy cannon might be a better option for that. Okay. Uh, this question seems really important. Do you okay. need approval before running these tests? So you, you, need, you need approval with the company you're testing, right? <clears throat> but not Azure. So historically, um, if you went back like five years or so, um, you used to have to fill out an authorization form um, where where you used to have to say like, all right, this is the company I'm testing. This is like the bandwidth I'm going to end up being, you know, using during the test and all that stuff. But Azure, AWS, GCP, they've all been like, ah, we don't need that information anymore. Just 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 as long as you got authorization from the customer, we're good. Um, and generally, they just don't want you you attacking their own infrastructure or like their employees. <laughs> like they don't want you like phishing Microsoft employees to get access to the customer you're pen testing. <laughs> That'd be bad. Uh, how do you make sure while doing attacks on Azure, you don't knock over a shared tenant? Um, so I haven't actually come up against that issue, to be honest. Um, I haven't, I haven't noticed any, any issues like that. Okay. Could you suggest some automation pen test checking tool uh, to verify existing detection controls for AWS, there's Leah, Leah, not, Leah, Leah Diaz, Leah, maybe something similar for Azure. Um, I mean, Scout Suite will get a little bit of that, that from, but not from like the security configuration side. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure about the security config side. I'm, I'm totally like bad because like definitely like red, red team or mindset over here. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of the blue team tools. But yeah, if anybody knows, um, feel free to post it in the Discord. I think this is a really important question too for a lot of the pe people here who are blue team. And we do get a lot of blue teamers that come and they wanna see how the attacks work and see what they can fix and make adjustments too. So what kind of alerts are being generated on the customer side? How stealthy are these or how hard are they to hunt for? <laughs> well, it depends across, you know, it depends on which attacks we're talking about, right? Um, something like password spraying, I mean, it shows up. Um, there are there, there are rules that you can put in place. Actually, I, I saw a blog post a couple of days ago talking about how to identify it, I think with Sentinel. Um, and I, so if you look through like my Twitter history, um, I think it was like maybe like yesterday, the day before, I retweeted somebody who um, posted a blog for, for detecting password spraying specifically in Azure. Um, so yeah, there's definitely logs. <laughs> Uh, and that's Daft Hack, Hack, Daft Hack on Twitter. Uh, so if you want to find his Twitter account, it's Daft, D-A-F-T-H-A-C-K. Uh, if you only access with read only, is that less likely to be noticed? Um, I mean, generally, if if you are given an account, I mean, they know about it, right? They know <clears throat> about that access. And it, I guess it, it kind of comes down to 
what alerting they have up in play as well. Um, but you know, looking at at you know just specific access to resources is something that could be potentially alerted on. So reading from key vaults, reading from um, storage buckets, that kind of stuff can be definitely alerted on. But I, you know, I would I would say that you know a lot of the maturity that we've seen across organizations haven't um, been at that level. Have you seen an effective evasion for MCAX or MCAS or Azure graph detections? Um, I'm not sure about that question. I don't know. Yeah. So if someone could explain what the MCAS is, that way we could uh, know. Do you have any tips for bypassing AWS advanced threat protection for phishing? No. <laughs> I don't have any tips. Yeah. Uh, how effective has Azure Identity, old Azure ATP, when domain controllers been at detecting your Azure activities while pen testing? Um, I, I would say we haven't had a whole lot of customers where they have, you know, either been using that or, or um, you know, brought up alerting uh, based off of based off of ATP. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't really have a whole lot of insight into, you know, that specific um, alert mechanism. I wonder if there's some Azure people here that are like. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't. Uh, uh, question about your class. Does breaching the cloud training include labs? Oh, yeah. 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 We have, it's somewhere between four and five a day, <clears throat> usually uh, four or five labs a day. Um, and they range from, you know, things like password spraying to privilege escalation to creating backdoors, service principle backdoors, that kind of stuff. We set up an entire C2 infrastructure with domain fronting. Fun stuff. <laughs> uh, did you ever get caught through O365 and possible travel alerts? Is it worth it monitoring it? Um, so yes, yes, definitely to both questions. Um, definitely worth monitoring for it. Definitely worth um, <clears throat> you know keeping an eye out for it. Uh, however, I will say that I have had like the <laughs> the craziest luck sometimes when it comes to um, <clears throat> where we can actually authenticate from. So I, I think like ideally, like if you're fishing for credentials, you know, with something like like Evil Gen X, um, you want that authenticated session to be coming from the same IP address, right? So like if they're authenticating through you, that IP address that's authenticating should be the same IP address that you end up using that session from. So in most cases, you want to actually point your browser um, that you want to use for using that that authentic authenticated session through your Evil Gen X server as well. So it looks like all of that access is coming from the same location. Um, I will say that I have had occasions where <clears throat> I didn't do that, fished a credential, and then attempted to use that session on another browser from another IP address, and that did not work. But I have had luck where, you know, we see like things like MFA in place, and you know, maybe maybe we we password sprayed, and I, I don't see any single factor access. I want to access Outlook, so I go to log in to see if there's MFA, and <clears throat> I've had occasions where. I go to log in and it's like automatically calling or automatically doing the push notification to the user. So I've had occasions where it's like, you know, you go to check and it's, oh, it's calling them right now. <laughs> and in those cases, um, I've actually had occurrences where the user is just like, oh yeah, Microsoft, that's that's normal. Hit the pound key and let them in <laughs> and give us access to the account. So yeah, uh, it ranges. Yeah, there's still a lot of questions coming in. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, is there anything in common between uh, AD or um, and Azure AD, or or there is no reusable knowledge? Yeah, I mean, so you know, setting up accounts is pretty similar. Um, you know, how you authenticate is very different, right? Like, there's no Kerberos um, authentication to Azure AD. Um, a lot of it's just you know OAuth based authentication. Um, but there, there's, you know, there's a lot of similarities. There's, you know, you don't have a lot of the same things like GPOs that you can deploy. Um, to Azure, um, you know, things like that. But I would say that, you know, at least some of the knowledge is similar. Uh, have you experienced a time where Microsoft seems to detect Firefox and throw false information at you? Um, I haven't yet, no. Um, I, I, have, I have had occasions where I have seen certain regions start to get locked out, which is honestly, like, I'm not entirely sure what's happening there. But I've seen where, like, I started using Firefox um, and US East one, right? <clears throat> and it's rotating IPs. Um, and then I start getting lockout alerts. And then, you know, I'm like, well, it's rotating. Why is that happening? Switch over to like US East two. 
and now no more lockout alerts. So um, I'm not sure if that's just them, like do, maybe doing some identification of the region specifically or what, but um, yeah, that's the closest I've gotten to it. Uh, does Microsoft Security Center provide any detection related to this type of testing? Yeah, I think they do. Um, I mean, again, like Red Teamer, uh, so um, I, I believe they do. Um, I, I've seen, definitely seen a few alerts come from customers on uh, Microsoft Security Center, um, so yeah. Uh, and I think one of the last questions we'll ask is how much of the breach in the cloud content has changed since it was offered last year? That's a good question. <clears throat> so the first time I saw it was April of 2020, I think, it's either April or May. And it was May. <clears throat> it was May? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so May 2020. And every single course, every or every single version that I've taught since then, which I, I think I've taught it about five or six times since then, um, has had at least something changed. It's usually small stuff though. Um, it's usually nothing like major, major, major. Usually it's it's things that I've like new, like breakthrough things that I've added. Um, but I would say like somewhere between like the 40 to 50 slide mark. Um, actually some labs have completely changed due to, um, some of the labs have completely changed due to just like things breaking or, or you know, different ways that Azure has actually changed, you know, things like, um, for example, authenticating with the um, AZ PowerShell module, like that used to create a session uh, token um, in, in one place, but now it uses a completely different set of uh, credential storage on disk. So things like that, like have changed, but it's not like crazy. Uh, last question, I think will be, uh, it's kind of long, so just stick with me. Okay. What is your take on Azure Enterprise app registrations for persistence? Software vendors are always asking for all kinds of excessive permissions when configuring SSO. So another directory.readwrite.all would likely, most likely go unnoticed. Yep, yeah, yeah. So I actually have a lab in, in the class for that specific thing. Um, <clears throat> so creating an OAuth application or you know an application within, within the Azure tenant is something that is super, um, honestly, like really popular uh, right now. Um, even, even the last couple of years, um, where they have the ability to create applications within within Azure and then provide certain permissions to those applications. So <clears throat> to give like an example here, you might create an application, like you said, with directory read write all, um, <clears throat> where that application has that permission to read access or write access to the directory. Um, the other thing that we look at is phishing and doing um, you know, you know, remote compromise against users via OAuth attacks. So if you can actually convince a user to click consent on the application uh, prompt, um, then that application can potentially have permissions within their own account. And that's something that we see in the news uh, more and more often, where you know users are consenting to permissions. And, and honestly, like if you think about it, like from a you know application, like a, like let's say you have like your mobile phone, right? And you you know you go to install a new app. And it says, you know, all right, this application wants access to your contacts. It wants access to email. I um, mean, you're just like, yeah, sure, whatever. It's the app I want. Um, <laughs> that's that's essentially the equivalent of Azure OAuth application consent phishing, um, where we create an application within a tenant, fish with that that application. Um, they just get a page that just says, hey, this page, this uh, this application wants permission to these things. Okay, sure. Um, they click consent. Now that application can read that data. So yeah, I think it's um it's definitely something to be aware of. Um, something that I teach in the class too. All right. Uh, my last shameless plug for myself is uh, one June 10th, I'm doing a live Black Hills webcast on how to give a presentation. And so it's a presentation on giving presentations wrapped within a presentation. It's the inception presentation. Uh, and so if you're interested in sharing your knowledge, if you have ever been asked or wanted to submit to a, a call for papers and you were shy or embarrassed or you weren't quite sure what to do or whatever the case is, uh, but you wanted to start sharing your knowledge with others, then come to June 10th and I'm going to give a presentation on presentations uh, that is going to be so meta using science and stuff where you're like, wait, you're in my brain right now. I'm like, yes, I am. Because I know exactly what you're thinking. All right. So with that, uh, Bo, any final words? Yeah. If you're looking for a job, go to his, uh, go to Jason's um, live streams that he does. He's yeah. like the, the man at getting people hired. So <laughs> thanks, Bo. Yeah, we're at 93 right now. We're almost on our 100th uh, viewer getting a new job. That is so awesome. Yeah, yeah, all right. Hey, thanks, everyone. I appreciate you guys coming so much. Um, yeah, definitely uh, let me know if, if, you, uh, if you have any questions or anything uh, yep. later on.
Thanks, Bo. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for being here on today's Black Hills Information Security webcast. If you ever need us, you know where to find us. Talk to you later. Bye. I am yeah. ending the webinar. And.